This is Pastor Gabriel Swagger, and we are excited to have you joining us tonight for our Crossfire services right here on the Sunlight Broadcasting Network. You're going to hear music that's going to be uplifting to your heart, preaching of the word, anointed, I should say, preaching of the word that will change your life. So stay right here on this channel for a great, great Crossfire service. We're going to go to music, then we're going to come right back with the preaching of the gospel. So don't move a muscle. We'll be right back.
I said, I'm free from sin. Are you free from sin tonight? Are you born again tonight? Come on, one more time. If you have your Bibles tonight, thank you, singers, musicians. Turn with me to the book of Genesis. Book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12. Turn me down just a little bit if you can, Caleb. I'm going to read just a little bit more scripture than normal tonight but it's for a purpose. Genesis chapter 12, beginning in verse number one. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, get thee out of your country 
and from your kindred and from your father's house unto a land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. And I will bless them who bless you and curse him who curses you. And in you shall all families of the earth be blessed. You're blessed. I said, you're blessed. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he departed out of Haran. And Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their substance that they had gathered, and the souls that they had gotten in Haran. And they went forth to go into the land of Canaan, and to the land of Canaan they came. And Abram passed through the land unto the place of Sychem, and to the plain of Morah, and the Canaanite was then in the land. And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto your seed will I give this land. And there built he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. And he removed from thence unto a mountain on the east of Bethel, and pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west and Hai on the east. And there he built an altar unto the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. And I want to use for a subject, ministering just for a few moments tonight, the subject matter, the journey of faith. The journey of faith. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you tonight in the name of Jesus. We thank you for your presence that we have felt in this place. We thank you that we have a new name and a new home over in Zion. Lord, I ask that you would anoint us to minister, anoint our ears to hear what you would have us say, and we ask it in the mighty name of Jesus, asking that you would ever increase as we would ever decrease. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. The life of Abraham, when you read about the life of Abraham, it to me, it is... One of the most captivating stories in the entirety of the Word of God. Here you have a man that was a heathen. He was not a Jew. He was a heathen. The Jewish people did not exist at this time. The son of idol worshipers. And there is some inclination that not only were his parents idol worshipers, but they were idol makers. They made idols. In particular, the moon god Ur. They lived in a place called Ur of the Chaldees. They worshiped the moon god Ur. But somehow, somewhere along the way, at least... Logically, you'd have to come to this conclusion that somehow during this time where all of his family members who were idol worshipers, all of his family members who were a part of this, of this religious effort, worshiping a God that did not exist, somewhere along the way he became disillusioned. Somewhere along the way, he, he, he had to have asked the question to himself, what is the purpose of worshiping a God that can neither speak, that may not hear what we say, that I've never seen up close except for uh, this wooden figure, this wooden trinket? Does he really even look like this? And somehow, some way, in the midst of this disillusionment, in the midst of maybe him questioning, of course it does not say this in the word of God, but I just have to tend to believe this, that in the course of all of this, somehow God came to Abraham. Now you got to think about this. His whole family were worshiping a moon God, a God that does not exist a God that was made up by someone in the annals of time. 
And we don't know if, if God actually showed up and appeared to him or just spoke to him. I don't know. But I have to believe that something, he saw something. Amen. Yeah. And I have to believe that he felt something that he had never felt before in his life. And let me tell you something. Whenever you, before you got saved, all you felt was bad stuff. But the moment that you felt Jesus... And the moment you heard about Jesus, you felt something that you never felt before in the entirety of your life. We don't know if God showed up or if he just spoke, but somehow he spoke to Abraham. And it's quite interesting to see that the words that he gave Abraham are just as meaningful to us today as they were back then. But before I get into that comment, I want to look at this. Abraham's life is a life and a journey of faith. Why? Why would we say and why could we say, why do we say that his life was a life of faith? Well, for number one, to hear from God, and right at that moment, drop everything and go. He didn't know where he was going. He didn't know when he would get there. He didn't know what God would actually do. All he knew was God told him to get out. And it took some years, but he finally got out. It's not, well, let me change it. It is, it is difficult at times when the Lord tells you to do something for us to actually follow that word and go after it and do it. Sometimes we feel in ourselves that we're not worthy of that or how am I supposed to do this or how is it going to happen when the Lord just tells you to do it. Oh, I wish I had somebody in here that understands what, what I'm talking about. Got one. <laughs> Chad makes it easy to preach. I'm just saying, you know. If we could just have some more people like him, it'd make, boy, I'd tear the roof off this joint. <laughs> but to not know where to go, to not know how you're going to get there, but the Lord told you to do it. Sometimes, that just boggles our mind. When the Lord tells us to do something or the Lord tells us this is going to happen, okay, and yet it doesn't happen right away. I'm getting off a little topic here, but let me just deal with this for a moment. How many times has God spoke to you and told you to do something or something was going to happen and you get so fired up about it and get so excited about it and yet a month goes by and you still haven't seen it? A year goes by and you still haven't seen it. Two years goes by and you still haven't seen it. It's kind of hard to continue to believe when you haven't seen it. Look at Abraham. Well, I'm going to jump ahead of myself just for one moment. God told Abraham, I'm going to make a nation out of you. He was childless. Never had a baby. Him and his wife, they couldn't have children. He was 75 years of age. She was 65 years of age. And God said, I'm going to make you a great nation. How? How is it going to happen? How is it possible? With man, it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. It doesn't matter how it's going to be done. And it doesn't really matter when it's going to be done. You just have to know that it's going to be done. Come on now. If God said it, then I believe it, and that settles it. I don't care what anybody else says. If God said I'm going to do something, I know that I know that I know that he's going to make sure it's going to come to pass. You see, whenever I say something about it, I say, I'll, I'll make sure and take care of that. My wife will tell you, I'll forget. Somebody would tell me, my secretary would tell you, my sister-in-law would tell you, my kids would probably tell you that if daddy says I'm going to do something, more than likely 
Sam has told me many times, Dad, did you forget? I'll give you a perfect example. On Monday, I drop the kids off at school as I do every morning, and Sam tells me, Daddy, I want you to pick me up first from school. Don't pick up Abby first. Pick me up first. I said, honey, I'll pick you up first. Monday afternoon rolls by. I get in line to pick her up. I've got Abby already. She opened up the door, and she saw Abby. She said, ah, Dad, I told you to pick me up first, and you promised. I said, oh, man, I did. I told her, I said, I'll promise you. I'll pick you up first tomorrow. And when I picked her up first, the first thing she asked me, is Abby in the car yet? I said, no, Abby's not in the car. We're going to pick her up. She said, good. I told you I wanted to be picked up first. When people tell you something, they'll promise you something. More than likely, they're going to break that promise. But when God tells you something, when God tells you that he's going to do it, when God tells you that I'm going to bless you, when God tells you I'm going to perform a miracle, when God tells you I'm going to move your mountain, when God tells you I'm going to provide for you when nobody else will, no matter what may happen, you better rest assured that God said he's going to do what he said he would do. He'll provide. He'll move. He'll bless you. He'll make a way where there seems to be no way. He'll tear down that mountain. When it's standing right and staring at you right in the eyes, daring you to go through it, God said, I'll make a way. I will make a way, and he'll provide a tunnel in the midst of that mountain so you can walk through that mountain. God said, he'll do it, he'll do it. But this journey that Abraham embarked upon, the journey of faith, when you read of this journey, understand that you're reading your own life. I'm reading my own life because this journey that we began at the moment of salvation, it is a journey of faith. It all started with faith. It began when God appeared into Abraham. His name was Abram back then. And told Abraham, Get out of your country. Leave your kindred. Remove yourself from your father's house. And go to a land that I will show you. We see in this journey of faith, before I get to my first point, three plans in action. You will read about God's plan for Abraham, what he wanted for Abraham what he desired, and that's what we're going to be looking at tonight. But at the same time, you're going to be looking at Satan's plan for Abraham. Understand, God does have a plan for you, but so does Satan. Satan desires you. Jesus told Peter, Satan desires you. To sift you as wheat. His desire for you is to steal, kill, and to destroy. His desire for you is to destroy your life to where you have nothing to show for it. Except a bad habit. Except sin. Except deception. Except death. Except destruction. But you also have a third plan. You have God's plan. You have Satan's plan, but you have a third plan that you read about, and that's Abraham's plan, what he wants for himself. And you're going to read, and you're going to find out that in your life, not only does God have a plan for you, not only does Satan have a plan for you, but many times we have a plan for ourselves, what we want to do. And that oftentimes gets in the way of what God wants to do. What God demanded of Abraham, now listen, God demanded this. This was not a suggestion. God did not appear into Abraham and tell him if you desire or if you see fit. He showed up to Abraham and told him, get out. 
Don't stay where you are. God's plan for you, number one, is to save you. But this is where the journey begins because God doesn't save you in sin to remain in sin. He saves you out of sin. He takes you out of something to place you into something. He took Abraham out of his land to bring him into another land. Oh, my. He desires the same of each and every single one of us. That's why it's so important that we must understand that God never saves us in sin. Because when, if, if we were to make that statement that God saves us in sin, then we would understand or that statement would say that, you know what, God saves us in sin for us to continue to live that life of sin. How shall we continue in sin? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? No. Get out. He doesn't want you to continue in that lifestyle because that lifestyle is nothing but death and destruction. God has something better for you. God has so much better planned for you. You think you've got it all figured out? Trust me, God's the one that has it all figured out. We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. He does. He does. Now, he demands separation. Young people, he demands separation from the world. He desires to bring you out of the world. He doesn't want you to stay in the world. You're in this world, but you're not of this world. When you get saved, you become a new creature, a new creation. You You have now become an alien in this land. This world is not your home. As Joseph was singing and the ladies were singing, the guys too, I got a home, a new home, over in Zion. It's not, it doesn't look like what I'm living in now. Because where I'm living in now, all you find is just bad things. You find and turn on the news, you've got the mess that's going on in Washington. You've got everything that's happening. All you hear is about is bad news. But when you get to glory, there will be no bad news. There's all there's going to be is good news. Because like you can say, I've got a new home. i got a new name. And it's over in Zion. Now listen. It's very important that we understand that when the Lord demands something, let me change this. God wants all of you. He doesn't want a part of you. He doesn't want you to come to church on Sundays or Wednesdays and to be holy. And then on the other days, nobody can even know or nobody can even tell if you're really a Christian. He wants all of you. He wants every part of you. He does not want you to dabble around committing spiritual adultery with the things of this world. You belong to Christ. You're married to Christ. You don't want to cheat on him with something else because why cheat on the best with something that's the worst when all you can have is the best? Does that make sense? Now, he demanded something from Abraham. Now, let's look at this. He told Abraham in the very first verse, Now, the Lord said unto Abraham, Get thee out of your country. What does this mean? Number one, leave this country. Now, that doesn't mean leave the United States of America. But understand that the true believer, which you and I are, if if you are saved, you are a believer. You seek a country. As Hebrews chapter 12 tells us that Abraham sought a country whose builder and maker was God. And the same goes for you and I here today. We, we serve and we are looking for a country whose, building, whose builder and maker is God. And understand that this world has nothing to offer us. The world has nothing to offer. Once you get saved, you realize that you look back and you say, why, why, why did I live like this? Why did I go that direction when I could have had this all along? Well, why? I don't understand. I look back at my life. Some of you will say and say, I was so foolish because I wasted so much time. 
I could have been productive in regards to the kingdom of God. And look what I have. Look, I've got joy that I've never felt before. The world offers unrest. God offers you peace. World offers you death. He offers you eternal life. The world offers you depression and oppression. God offers you the baptism with the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking with other tongues. The world offers you sickness. God offers you health. Come on now. The world will take. God will bless. The world will take. God will bless. The world takes. God blesses. The world has lost its appeal. Have you ever woken up and you've desired something and you've got something and you looked at it and you looked back and said, what was that all about? I'll give you a case in point. All of you, I shouldn't say all. Some of you in here play video games. How many play video games? Just be honest. Y'all gamers. Xbox. I don't know. They got the new one coming out. Was the Xbox One. PlayStation 4. Man, whenever I was growing up, Nintendo. That was it, man. Oh, yeah. No, not Super Nintendo. I'm talking regular Nintendo. I'm talking like you had to press the game in, press it down. If it didn't work, you had to bring it up and... And put it back in, and you had two buttons, an A and a B. You had a select and a start, and you had a up and down and left and right. That's all you had. Now you've got like A, B, X, Y, D, F, and G, and you know, A minus and B, B, whatever, and then you've got directional pads, you got screens, and you've got, you know, buttons on the top, buttons on below. I mean, you got buttons everywhere. I looked at a remote control the other day. I said, my Lord, I, I long for the days of two buttons and a, joy, and a joystick. But you, I remember, man, when we got a game and you played it, I came up in the generation of double dribble. Yeah. Double dribble. Dirt, dirt, dirt. And you could always go to one spot which is like always over on this corner, 900 feet away from the basket, and you can shoot it, and it makes it every single time. <laughs> and you play it certain, you know, for a certain amount of time, and all of a sudden, it loses its, its luster. It loses its, its uh, Super Mario Brothers. I still never beat Super Mario. <laughs> I gave up after the second round because I said, what's the point? I'm impatient. Never beat Mike Tyson. A, B, A, B, left, right, left, right, up, down, up, down, select, start. You got, you got, you know, whatever. You got Mike Tyson right there. It's a code. But it loses its appeal. And after a while, you don't want to play it anymore because it's boring. Why play it? I've already done it. I, it doesn't, what's the benefit of it? Once you've lived in the world, you look back and say, what was I thinking? It's lost its appeal. The drugs have lost its appeal. The sex lost its appeal. The alcohol has lost its appeal. It's now become a bondage, and you don't know what else to do, but God's given you a way out. I said he's given you a way out. That all you got to do is by faith believe it. He takes you in. He pulls you out of that mess and places you into Christ. It's a whole different ball game. He says, get out of your country. The world's lost its appeal, and the world has nothing to offer. You realize that the world has nothing to offer us. But then not only does he say, get out of your country, which is pretty strong. He then makes a statement. He says, and from your kindred. What does this mean? Does this mean that now you have to leave your family? No, really what this means is this. You now belong to Christ. Even though you love your family, what Christ wants takes precedent over what anybody else wants. And that's something that most don't want to do. Most, they may get out of the world, but when it comes to this, you know, Jesus said, if you love your father and mother and brother and sister more than I do, you, you, you can't belong to me. What is he saying there? He's not telling you to love your parents. 
love your brothers and sisters. He's just saying this, that even though you love them, you now belong to him. And what he wants takes precedent over what anybody else wants. And the next one takes it a step further. Leave your country, leave your kindred, and leave your father's house. What's he saying here? There's something that everyone, if every parent wants the best for their child. Every parent wants something. They want their child to be successful. And some parents have marked a path for their child to walk in. But when that child becomes a born-again Christian, it's no longer really what the parents want and the path that they've chosen. It's God's path. And many times, or all the time, God's path, well, many times I would say, many times God's path is nowhere near what your mom or dad want. Some of your mom and dads want you to be a, law, a lawyer, a doctor, surgeon, basketball player, athlete, whatever. God just, if God wants you to be a ditch digger, that's what you should be. Because there's more in that than anything else that a man has to offer. You may have the riches and you may have the wealth, but you've got no peace. But you may be on the bottom of the totem pole, and if that's what God's called you to do, you're going to have so much peace, you don't know what to do with it. In the midst of all that, you can say, I'm doing what God has called me to do. And that's in another area where most people say, wait now. This is where most people hold, hold back and say, Lord, I love you, but I'm not going to do that. Can I be honest with you? I battled that same thing. I was saved when I was five, baptized with the Holy Spirit at the age of eight. I knew at the age of eight God called me to preach. I knew it. When I became a teenager, I fought it. When I was in high school, we had a, a lady. She was not from here. She was from, I believe, was one of the islands. Trinidad or something like that. Her name was Miss Claire. We called her Mama Claire. She was about that tall. And every day she worked the lunch line. And every day when I went through the lunch line in school, she'd walk up to me. She said, you're going to be a preacher. I said, no, I'm not. She said, boy, shut up. You are. <laughs> and she said, she looked at me. At how, I don't know how many times she told me. She said, Gabriel, it's not about what you want. And it's not about what your parents want. It's about what he wants. And he said, Gabriel, you better do what God's called you to do. And I said, Mama Claire, you're going to have to get somebody else to do it. She said, no, uh you're the one. I said, no, ma'am, I'm not. She said, yes, you are. Don't argue with me. <laughs> and if you don't know Mama Claire, understand, whenever she said don't argue, you don't argue with her. Because she'll spank you. She will. Every day, 14, 15, 16, 17, senior in high school, sitting in the lunch line, or sitting on my lunch table, and she would purposely walk over to where I was and tell me, God's called you to preach. And I said, Mama Claire, he may have, but I'm not doing it. She said, yes, you are. She said, it's not about what anybody else wants. It's about what God wants, and he wants you to preach, and you're going to do it. And I said, no, I'm not. In college, 18 years old, still feeling that call of God. And I said, no, I'm not going to do it because my excuse was I know what the church is really like. I know what the church is really like, and I'm not standing in front of my peers and embarrassing myself. Not going to do it. And I remember sitting there in my car about 10.30 at night, heading home. I was visiting a friend. Driving home, I'm sitting there in my car. I was right on Blue Bonnet Boulevard, right underneath the, tra the train tracks on that dip. And when I got to that dip, I just said in my heart, I said, God, I can't do this. I know you've called me to preach, but I don't want to do this because of the shoes I have to fill. I cannot fill 
the shoes of my grandfather or my father. I can't do it. And I promise you, the Lord spoke to my heart. He said, Gabriel, I didn't call you to fill their shoes. I called you to fill your own. And when he said that, I said, Lord, I know what you've called me to do, and finally I'm going to do it. He said, I've been waiting on you to say that. You know, it's not about what, what this whole thing is. He was trying to tell me, it's not about what you want. You may want something for your life, but it's really not about what you want. It's about what he wants. You may want to marry somebody, but God may say, uh-uh, we're not going to do that. That's not the one I want you to be with. You may desire something, and you say, God will say, uh-uh, that's not what I want. Well, I want to go here for college. I, I did that. I ran. I went to, how many colleges are there? One, two. I went to three different colleges before I found the one I was supposed to be at. Well, I was supposed to be at the second one, and I left it, only to come back to it three years later. I ran from it. Even then, I was still running from it. But that call, that draw was still there. That call was still there, and finally it had to take me running my head up against a brick wall several times for me to finally say, Lord, I give up. I give up, and it's time for some of you to just give up in a good way and just say, Lord, I'm going to do what you've called me to do regardless of what the consequences are. Because let me tell you something. Whatever you may think consequences are, they pale in comparison to the blessings that God will give you. I got to hurry. He said, leave everything. It took some time for Abraham to do it just like it takes all of us to do it. But finally, he left. But I want you to look at when God had a plan, when he saves you, he brings you out of something. And in this salvation experience, when he brings us out of sin, the very next step, the step that he brings us into is a step and a step of blessing. You remember when you got saved? Some of you remember whenever the day you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Some of you has been so long ago, you forgot. But some of you remember, it seems like yesterday to some of you, when well, next thing you know, the blessings of God were just pouring down all around you. I mean, you were being blessed. You were being blessed like you'd never been blessed before. I mean, things were starting to happen. God was opening up doors. God was providing for you. God was making ways for you. God was doing this. He was doing that. He was moving upon you. He's speaking to you. He's dealing with you. And it's blessing. You got to understand, God's a blessing God. He wants to bless you. He told Abraham, Abraham, not only do you need to get out and go to a land that I'm going to show you, but here's what I'm going to do. He said, I'm going to, number one, the first promise he gives to Abraham, I'm going to make you a great nation. My Lord, that should make you shout. I'll bless you. I'll make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. That's the first promise. You look at that word, blessing. What does the word bless mean? Come on, tell me. Increase. How many like increase? How many love decrease? You like increase, don't you? Blessing means increase. Abraham was childless. Couldn't have a child. And it all depended on him having a son. And God says, even though you're childless, I'm going to make you a great nation. I'm going to bless you so much you won't know what to do with. I'm going to make your name great. And guess what? Because of his blessing, it fell down to us. Because of his blessing, it came down to you and me. Because of what happened to him, you and I, we, were, we, we got on the tail end of it. Because he said, I'll make your name great. I'll make you, I'll make you a great nation. Guess what? You're a part of it. It's called the blessings of Abraham. Abraham believed God. And it was accounted unto him for righteousness. The same way that he got saved is the same way that you got saved is the same way I got saved. And guess what? That's the greatest blessing of them all. He wants to bless you. He gives him three promises. Number one, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make your name great. I'm going to do so much for you, you won't even know what else to do. Then he says this, verse number three, promise number two. I'm hurrying. And I will bless them who bless you and curse him who curses you. That's promise number two. When you give to the right work, oh, it's real quiet now. 
When you give to the right work, he's going to bless you. This also speaks for Israel, but it also speaks for every single one of you. You are guaranteed blessings because of Jesus Christ, not because of you, but because of Jesus Christ. I'm trying to hurry. The third promise found in verse number three, and in you shall all families of the earth be blessed. You're blessed tonight. You're a part of of this covenant that God made with Abraham. All of this, if you really want to look at it, this whole promise would lead to the formation of the nation of Israel. And on top of that, that greater promises signify the birth and the coming of the Messiah. To do for us what we could not do for ourselves. Now listen, I'm not going to be able to finish this. We're going to move it on to next week. Because when God saves you, he begins to bless you. But you can't just stay on blessings. Now, God blesses you every single day. But you just can't stay there. God has to test you. Because whenever Abraham arrived in this land, the first thing he noticed was the Canaanites were there. There's always going to be some Canaanites. The flesh that's just trying to steal what God has given you. You know, this, this is a perfect example of Satan trying to move you away from God's inheritance that he's given you. Your inheritance, my inheritance, everything that God's given you was because of what Jesus Christ has done. And Satan's not going to rest until he tries his best to move you away from what God has done for you. He will do what he can to move you away. So don't be alarmed whenever you, you start this journey of faith. He brings you out of something to bring you into something. He blesses you. But don't be alarmed when you see some Canaanites show up. Don't be alarmed when you see Canaanites in the land. But the thing that you've got to do is what Abraham did. Even though the Canaanites were in the land, he was in the land that God promised him, that I will give you and unto your seed. Then he says this. It's written that Abraham built an altar. One writer said this. Abraham and the patriarchs, you never read of them building a house for themselves. But you read of them building an altar for God. Meaning this, that our focus, as the altar represents the cross, the altar represents what Jesus Christ did for us at Calvary. The altar represents the judgment of God that came upon Christ when it should have, it should have, came upon, it should have come upon us. But thank God that he took our place. It represents, and this represents, that despite the Canaanites, despite the distractions and the test, if you will, Abraham's focus was not upon himself, but he was upon that altar. When you, signal, when you make the cross of Christ the center of your faith, the center of your life, the object of your faith, despite hell, Despite Canaanites, despite Hivites, despite termites, despite everything under the sun, when your faith is anchored in Christ and what he did at Calvary, despite all of that, that is your key, that is your source of victory, that is your source of blessing, that's your source of hope, that's your source that even though everything may be going wrong, that is going right and that will never go wrong. When your faith is anchored in Christ, I'm closing, singing musicians, make your way back. You, when your faith is anchored in Christ and what he did, you've got to make a resolution in yourself as young people to say this, that despite all that, I'm not going to be moved. Because what God has done for me, it'll last until the day that I die. It will continue to bring blessings upon me, and it will continue to bring me victory in my life. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm cutting it short right now. I'm closing right now. 
We're going to look next week at Satan's plan, and we're going to look at Abraham's plan. God has a plan, and it always deals with blessing. Satan's plan is for destruction. And in this journey of faith that you and I will embark on, you've got to understand what's coming your way. And next week, we're going to look at that. Stand to your feet if you can, all over this building. I pray that you have gotten something out of this short, well, I wouldn't say short, but this message. And I pray that whatever is taking place in your life, whatever the good or the bad may be, that you can stand to say that I, I'm not going to be moved. As we sing it one more time, I want Joseph to sing that chorus, I shall not be moved. I just want you to raise your hands all over this building right now. And I just want you to make that declaration of faith tonight to say that I'm not going to be moved. That I know that God's called me here. I know that God's brought me here. He's brought me safe thus far. And I know he's going to bring me the safe the rest of the way home. And that despite what others may say, my focus is on the cross. My focus is on Calvary. My focus is on what Jesus Christ has done. My focus is on what Jesus Christ has done for me. And as we sing it, let's just raise our hands all over this building. Sing it right now. Just like a tree that's planted by the waters. Say it right now, I'm not going to be moved. Sing it one more time right now. Come on, sing it now. Just like that tree. Just one more time before we dismiss. I shall not be moved. Sing it now. Thank you so much for joining us today here at Crossfire Youth Ministries. Once again, I really believe that the message has been a benefit to your heart. It's lifted you up. It has ministered to your soul. And we pray that the Lord has blessed you richly through this message. Once again, thank you for being with us. And don't miss the services that come to you right here from Crossfire Youth Ministries.